So all of that is the innate immunity. All that is the non-specific immunity. Okay? If a Antilly comes in, or a burglar comes in, or a mailman comes in, you're going to get the same response. The picket fence is going to be treating the, those three characters the same way. Fido is going to treat them the same way. Okay? Now we've got the acquired immunity. Now it's a little bit different. The master comes out, he could recognize what's going on, and he's going to determine what to do with it. Okay? So here's our picket fence, the first line of fence. This is our Fido the dog. Right? And now you've got the master that comes out. Okay? So again, we just talked about all this with the innate or natural or non-specific, all these different words. You know, that's the other thing, too. Um, I always tell my students in uh, AMP 1 and 2, in order to master AMP 1 and 2, in order to master anything in medicine, you've got to know how to say one word about 20 different ways. Right? That's basically what it is. So that, you know, because I teach you here is the, the innate immunity, and you go into some other course and they're calling it the non-specific immunity, you got to know it's going to be foreign to you. Well, anyway, you also have the acquired, the adaptive, or the specific immunity, and this is basically dealing, again, with the B cells and T cells, right? And also antibodies, which the B cells are what they do. Okay? So we got this, basically, the B cells is going to turn into plasma cells, which will turn into immunoglobulins, which is a fancy word for antibodies, right? The cell mediated, is got the T cells, and they're going to make what we call cytotoxic T cells, also known as killer T cells. They're also going to make helper T cells, and they're also going to make suppressor T cells, where a lot of cytokines will get released. So this we basically just handled just now, and now this is the part that we'll talk with now. Okay. Um, so the humoral uh, immunity, this is the one with the antibodies, okay? We have vir virgin B cells that have never, ever, ever seen that antigen before, okay? Um, then we have... Plasma B cells, they secrete antibodies, okay? And then we also have the memory B cells, which are have seen the antigen before, and the second response is going to be much faster than the first response, okay? Because it's seen it before, it knows how to battle it, okay? So what's happening here is this. Here you've got a macrophage, you see the little bacteria. It's going to engulf that through phagocytosis, break up the bacteria, save a piece of it as an antigen. It's now going to present that antigen to the innate system, right? This is all the natural system, all right? And this is, did I say innate? I mean, I'm sorry, the acquired system. So let me rephrase it. So this is the innate system, the natural system, the nonspecific system, phagocytosis. This is going to present, this macrophage will present it to part of the adaptive, the acquired, the specific system. That's a B cell. So they're going to present this antigen to this B cell over here. Um, and this B cell will be able to make memory B cells or it can change into a plasma cell, and the plasma cell can make antibodies. We'll talk about what antibodies do. It's also going to, um, and we'll talk about this one also, but it's also going to present to a helper T cell, and the helper T cell is then going to stimulate the B cell. So the B cell is going to get really tired. It's like, all right, this is enough antibodies I need to make. But this helper T says, uh-uh, don't stop. We need more antibodies. So it makes more and more and more. Well, okay, I'll make more antibodies, but I'll only make more memory cells. No, it's kind of pushing it. Make more. We need more. Okay? So that's what's happening. Helper T cell is what we have as our dispatcher. Okay? 
the dispatch, when you call up and there's a burglar there, right? The master is going to call up. The dispatcher will say, okay, what's going on over there? Well, we have one burglar that came on. If, she, if the master says, well, there's a few houses here that, that actually um, are being burglarized, well, then the dispatcher is going to say, well, I'm not going to tell the police to leave. I need to get more backup over there, right? That's what's happening. Think of this as a story, all right? So that's what's happening with, with antibodies, okay? Now, cellular is where the T cells come in. All right, so we have helper T cells. That's our dispatcher. I personally think, and a lot of people think, that the helper T cell is the most important cell in the immune system. If you don't have the dispatcher, you're not going to get anything else over there, right? Think about calling up the dispatcher 911 and no one's answering. I mean, that's what HIV is doing. If HIV is smart, it's going to destroy the dispatcher, and they're not going to get anyone there. So we have helper T cells. And we have cytotoxic, also called killer T cells. Now, also, too, you should know this, there's going to be a receptor on there of the helper T cell has a CD4. On the killer T cell, they have something that's called CD8. So we also refer to helper T cells as P4 cells. We also refer to killer T cells as T8 cells, and that's where that comes in. We also have suppressor T cells that also have the... CD8 on it also, but we don't, for confusion purposes, we don't call these T8 cells. The only thing that T8 cells are is the killer T cells, even though these two do have the uh, CD8, all right? So it's kind of defaulted to that. This is going to inhibit B cells and T cells, okay? Um, so that it doesn't overstimulate, all right? You want to get just what you're supposed to, not anything more. Okay? This could be a problem with allergies also. All right? And we also have memory T cells where this, it remembers the antigen and the second response is much faster than the, the first. Okay? So in this case here, here's your macrophage. It's going to engulf a bacteria, break it all up, and there's going to be a piece of the antigen that's going to stay there. We have a T cell over here that's going to bind over here. The connection. The innate system needs to talk with the acquired system. You have to have this connection. Once the connection happens, then this cell can make a killer T cell, a helper T cell, a suppressor T cell, a memory T cell got to tell it what to do. So this is just a recap of naming, right? Helper T cells are known as CD4 cells or T4 cells. Cytotoxic T cells are killer T cells, CD8 cells, or T8 cells. They're the same thing, okay? In your book or in your future classes or in my lectures or on my exams, just make sure you know that you mean the same thing, okay? All right, now we have self-antigens. Every cell in our body has antigens, okay? Everything. And it's our way of trying to figure out, is that going to be foreign or is that not going to be foreign? If it's foreign, it will destroy it, that particular thing. If it's not, then it'll just ignore it. So what I'm going to say is, so if I was going to get need a, a kidney transplant, and I'm going to get it from another human, so we're the same, right? Another human. So what's going to happen is I get it from my next door neighbor. I get the, the kidney in there. Am I going to fight against it? I sh yeah, I will. Because that's not... In fact, the only two people that won't... That, that if you give this person a transplanted kidney, your body won't fight against it is an identical twin. So if you do have an identical twin, don't ever get in a fight with him or her. You're going to need her, maybe. Okay, so your body will fight against it because they see as that as a foreign thing. There's antigens that it can't recognize and will will fight against it. Now, what if I burn off my nose? Okay, my nose is burnt off, and the doctors say, you know what? We got we can actually make a cosmetic nose for you. But we're gonna have to take a piece of skin from your ass. Okay, 
So they take a piece of skin and they put it over here. Now, it's not something I want to smell all day long, but, um, but will my body fight against this? No, why? It recognizes my self-antigens. It's just a different location, but it's not foreign to it. Okay? So that's what's going on over here, is that your body has to recognize if these being self or not. Okay? There's no Im 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 um, immune response to our cells. So other humans recognize these as non-self. If I take my skin and give it to someone else, their body will react to it. Okay? And these are where transplants come in. So where does all this take place? How does your body know the difference between self and non-self? Well, it's in your DNA. It's in a certain part on chromosome number six. It's called a major histocompatibility complex. And that's the area that will determine if something is self or non-self. So this thing is very important. This is where the match comes in, in terms of matching uh, donors and recipients, is this MHC. Well, in humans, the MHC is referred to as the human leukocyte antigen. I guess if this was a pig, they would call it the pig leukocyte antigen. But overall, on the big picture, it's all the MHC. Okay? So every human cell has these surface antigens on them. All right? And T cells can recognize as non-self antigens or self antigens. All right? They attack non-self, and I'll ignore the self, just as I explained to you. Okay? Identical twins have identical MHC. So there wouldn't be any kind of attack there. You have two classes of MHC. Class 1 binds to killer T cells, and class 2 will bind to helper T cells. Okay? An antibody. We have immunoglobulins as a fancy word for antibody. Same thing. Okay? We have five different antibodies. First one I want to talk about is IgM. IgM is our largest one, and it's a pentamer, meaning that, well, a regular antibody is shaped like a Y. And I don't want to go into details, but you've learned about that, right? So it's shaped like a Y. In this case, a pentamer is, there's five of these antibodies all together like this, and it's the largest one kind of sits like that. That's an IgM. Ig, I'm sorry, yeah, IgM. An IgM is the first one that's going to be made when it sees this antigen. So if I see someone who has a lot of IgM, I know that they've been exposed to this antigen for, or virus, whatever it is, for the past six months. It's like an acute infection. All right? This is the one that happens first. Then we have IgG. And IgG is just going to be one of these. This is more of the classic, um, the classic antibody. And this is the most predominant one we have in our body. About 75% of all your antibodies are these. This occurs more in second responses. So if you've got a chronic infection going on, you've had hepatitis B for like 20 years, you're going to have your IgG up, but IgM will be very low. See, that's helping me to figure out, is this a new infection, is this an old infection? Does that make sense? This is the, also the only one, IgG is the only one that crosses the placenta barrier. So it crosses the placenta <laughs> barrier, now maternal IgG goes to baby, and baby gets to keep those, those antibodies for the next six months. So it has some sort, of, some sort of protection for the next six months by some time until the baby can, or the newborn can build its own immunity. God bless you. Okay? We also have IgA. And IgA is what we call a dimer. And it has two of these on here. IgA is found in the mucous membrane. Think of like the... Um, uh, secretions, like your GI tract, the nasal passageway, it's on those areas. It's also found in the breast for breast milk. So this is the reason why. After six months, the baby loses all its maternal IgG. So I encourage breastfeed so that the baby can get the IgA until the baby's immune system is built up. Does that make sense? Right? 
Then we have IgE, that's just like a, uh, just a single one over here, monomer we call it. And that increases during allergies and also during parasitic worms. This is an easy mnemonic because you also see with eosinophils, they go up during allergies and uh, parasitic worms. So the E is helping with that one. Okay? Um, and then we have the IgD. This one we don't know much about. We know it exists, low, there's a low amount. Uh, we have some idea that it probably activates the B cells, but we don't know much more about that. Okay? So that's what's going on with those five. So you should know those five. That's a really brief synopsis of review of those five. And that's what they kind of look like. Right? All right, so antibody production, all right, the primary response. What will happen is this. You get chicken pox. You're exposed to chicken pox for the first time. It's going to take two to, two to three weeks, 14 to 21 days, for your body to actually build an immunity and do something to it. But until then, the virus of, of, of uh, chicken pox, VSV, uh, is going to, or VSC, is going to, um, is going to manifest with all those itchiness, and some people get them really bad. I got them in, my, in between my fingers and stuff, and really itchy. Until your immune system can fight it off, it's going to take some time to do that. Okay? That's our primary response. That's what's going to happen there. All right? IgM will go up during that time, and then it'll, there's enough there to, to, to kill off or to scare off that virus, and then the virus will stay in certain areas, it'll stay like in your uh, dorsal root ganglion in the spinal cord. And it'll sit there. All right? Viruses, for the most part, they stay with you. All right? They don't usually go away like bacteria with antibiotics. Most viruses, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. All right? uh, like certain viruses, um, herpes and stuff like that, they usually stay with you. If you've got an immune system that's good, it kind of homes them down though. Okay? So, Primary response is what happens. If you get exposed to chicken pox again, but your immune system is still good and remembers exactly what it did last time, well, guess what? Next time you get exposed to chicken pox, your immune system happens very fast and will tone it, hone it down really bad, so much that you won't see anything on your skin. So you get chicken pox for the first time, you get the full, you know, the full features, classic features. But now, five years later, your little sister has chicken pox, so you're exposed to it again, but you don't see anything on you because your immune system remembers exactly what it did last time, and your IgG will predominate at that time. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? So this picture here is kind of showing what I just told you. So what happens is the first exposure, it's going to take, let's say, you know, 14 to 21 days for you to get this response. not that strong, and it takes a long time to get that. But your, eye, your antibodies and your memory B cells and everything stays with you so that if you get exposed a second time, the time between <clears throat> the, the exposure and when your immune system kicks in, has, it's not, you're not waiting all two weeks, you're waiting like a few hours. And that, not only is this a short time, but the response is astronomically higher than what happened before, so much that you don't see anything on your body. Okay? And that's what happens. Okay? Now, the ways we acquire uh, adaptive immunity is we can do it naturally. We can either do active or passive. Active is that you're thrown right into that, that infection. You're thrown right into the chicken pox. And you're being exposed to it. And you get a natural way of building that immunity. Okay? So that's a natural active thing. You get that infection. The natural passive is if mom has an infection and it gets passed down to the baby through the placenta. Or mom has an infection and it gets passed down, like HIV can pass down through the milk. There's two reasons why I don't want women to breastfeed, uh, and, or two instances. One, if they have HIV, all right? And two, if they have IV drug use, because that will be passed down too. So that's what I'm saying, is you can do this naturally passive way through the breast milk or through the placenta, okay? 
Then you have the artificially acquired immunity. We could either do it by way of this artificially active, and a good example, best classic example, is a vaccine. When you get a vaccine, what's actually what they're actually giving you is a weak, what we call attenuated part of that virus. We're giving you the virus, but it's very weak and it's a very small amount. It shouldn't cause you to have any kind of symptom. Certain people like this does, but not less. It's not so bad. So your body sees that antigen, builds an immune response to it, and then when it sees it for the real time, it already, so the second exposure, it already knows what to do, and you shouldn't have that infection at least showed on, on all over your body. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the influenza virus, well, that mutates each year. So that's why they always got a new vaccine every year, because they give you the vaccine that, of the, and there's a lot of different serotypes of that, of, of the uh, influenza virus. So they kind of give you the worst ones that are found that year of the vaccine. So that's why every year you got a new one, because um, and you'll learn about um, the antigenic uh, drip when we do um, uh, the, um, uh, infectious disease. So that's how that works. All right. So you should know how vaccines work. We also have artificially passive. Now this one, uh, the classic one I could think of is a snake bite. You go to the zoo. And there's a king cobra snake there, and you want to pet it. All right? You pet it. He snaps at you, and he bites you. So now you got venom in you. Smart move. Okay? So you, you get bit by this king cobra. Well, your body will fight against that antigen. But the problem is it's going to take two to three weeks to get it the way we saw chicken pox. It'll take that long. You'll be dead long before that happens. So that won't, be, won't, won't, won't work. Okay? So what they have is antibody, antibodies in a vial at the, uh, at the zoo. So if you get bit by a king cobra snake, they took antibodies who from before had the, the, the snake bite, and they took the antibodies, and it's a long process to do it, but they take the antibodies from that person and they put it in a vial. That match for that antigen, right? So now they're going to give you the antibodies set off. You're actually cutting time. In other words, we're not going to wait for your body to make these antibodies over two to three weeks. We're just going to give you the antibodies. And then you'll set an immune response in a matter of seconds. And that's what that is. Okay? So you see the difference between all this? These are where, again, these should, this should be all reviewed for you guys. And again, it's showing the same thing over here. Natural active, artificial active, natural passive, artificial passage and the whole thing. Okay? Questions on that? All right, so now let's put the whole thing together. Okay? The whole thing. We showed you the players of the football team, but now, if you don't know how to play football, all right, well, we just introduced you to all the players, now let's play the scrimmage. Let's see what the quarterback actually is going to do in order to win the game. All right? What's the purpose of defense and offense? All this, the kicking team and so forth. Let's put it all together. All right? You can put your pencils down. Everything's up here, and everything I'm going to uh, say to you is, is written right over here. But look what's happening here. Here's your macrophage, sees the bacteria, engulfs it, breaks it up, and it's going to present, because now this is the antigen presenting cell, it will present that antigen to the adaptive system. Okay? In this case, it's going to present it to a helper T cell. When you've got this connection that goes on right here, then this macrophage is going to release interleukin-1 to stimulate that helper T cell. And that helper T cell, when it's stimulated, will release interleukin-2 to make killer T cells, or stimulate, not make them, but actually get them there. And it's also going to get B cells there to make antibodies. It will also tell this helper T cell to go through mitosis and make more helper T cells so that we get more help. This is your dispatcher. All right? 
Here's if there's a burglar there, it's going to get the, the uh, if they have to get the SWAT team, if they have to get the, the police over there, that's what they're going to do. If there's a lot of burglars going on in that neighborhood, then this is going to tell more, it's, you know, if they're going to be saying, like the dispatcher says, you know what, I'm getting a lot of phone calls, get ready because they're going to be giving, so they're going to get more helper T-cells on the case here. See what's happening? If you lose this, you're not going to get anything. And that's what HIV does, is it kills the helper T cell. So you have this helper T cell that releases all these cytokines to make sure it does all these different things. You destroy this, as HIV does, you're getting nothing here. And then that infection is going to get worse and worse and worse. Is that clear? Okay. In this case here, this is a killer T cell. Here's an infected cell. It's going to break up that bacteria or virus, put it the piece of it over here, the antigen piece, it's now going to present it to the adaptive system. Here's a killer T cell. You make a connection here, and when the connection happens, it releases perforins into that cell to, to put holes into that cell, allowing ions and water to go in there, change the membrane potential, and throw that whole cell and burst it. We need to destroy that cell. I know it's your own cell, but it's making a lot of viruses. It's already contaminated. So we just have to get rid of it. There's nothing else we can do with it. It's a lost cause. But we've got to get rid of that to save the other cells. Um, okay, so let's talk about this. This is, um, again, a uh, view for uh, most of you, all of you, hopefully. Um, the this is basically the immune system, uh, the football fight, or the football game, happening right here. Each one of these players, the quarterback, the tight end, and so forth, the kicking team, has their own function of what they're supposed to do. That's the part that I expect you guys to know. And then the football game itself, you should know how the whole thing's played out. But I'm going to show you this play of how if a virus gets inside your body, how does all these players interact with each other? It should be a good summary, a uh, review for you. If none of this, if some of this doesn't make sense, or some of it does make sense, and you need to review, then that's the part you need to go back to. Okay? It's a very busy slide. I'll show you how everything comes together. Um, Hopefully the words will, you'll recognize a lot of the words I put in here. So let's say there's a cell of your body here that has been infected with a virus. Okay? Now, we'll go a little bit to microbiology. A virus, the way that uh, viruses work is that it incorporates, it gets in, it sneaks inside the cell, and then it incorporates part of its nucleic acid, whether RNA or DNA, and puts it into your DNA. And then there's a mechanism that tells your cell to make a certain protein to make another virus. So it's kind of like, think of a Xerox machine, and I'm making a lot of, I'm making copies of your exam. I turn my back around, and someone sneaks in an advertisement for a campus party puts it into my exam, and now it's making all these copies of my exam with a new advertisement in there. And I don't know about this. And you're getting free advertisement. You see? That's what a virus does. And it spits out tons of viruses over here. Does that make sense? Okay? That's how viruses basically work. Okay? So this cell that's been infected by a virus is now spitting out new viruses. 
we got to stop that because a lot of viruses can cause cancer, they cause other diseases that can be fatal and so forth. So we got to cut down on this. So this is what happens. This is putting out thousands of viruses. We now have macrophages, okay, that are going to see that virus and engulf it. Now, we don't have many macrophages compared to the number of viruses that are coming out of all these cells. Maybe there's 10,000 viruses, just give you numbers, but maybe there's 10,000 viruses that come out of these cells, but macro macrophages, we only got, let's say, 100. So it's not going to, it's going to kill that one virus, but there's too many viruses. We're not going to be able to do all that. So we got to be able to, I mean, if you have, let's say, a crime happening here, and we only got so many uh, security guards or police, if there's too many crimes going on here, they're going to have to call the government to bring in the SWAT team and so forth. You see what I mean? You have to get backups. So that's what we got to do over here. So this macrophage is going to engulf this virus, bring that virus inside, break it all up, and put a piece of it out here on what we call a class 1, I'm sorry, class 2 MHC, major histocompatibility. Okay? All stuff from your A and B2. So this sticks out a piece of an antigen from that virus. Okay? This is still the nonspecific part of your immune system, but it has to present it to the specific part of your immune system. So we also refer this macrophage as an antigen-presenting cell. It presents that antigen to the specific immune system. Now we have this CD4 cell, also referred to as a helper T cell, or T4 cell. And this recognizes the class 2 MHC and binds it. Now, as soon as this binds to the class 2 MHC, this tells the macrophage to release interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 is now going to activate the helper T cell. This is going to get activated, and it's going to reproduce make this go through mitosis, it's going to make more helper T cells. How? Because it's activating this helper T cell to release interleukin-2 to cause more mitosis of this to happen. What else this helper T cell is going to do? It's going to activate through interleukin-2, it's going to activate CD8 cells, also referred to as killer T cells, also referred to as cytotoxic T cells, also referred to as T8 cells. This is going to get activated, and it's a killer T cell. So what does it do? Well, meanwhile, this caught on. I noticed that there was, um, someone put the advertisement there, but we have too many advertisements already out, but I noticed it, so I was able to stop it break one of the, um, uh, the viruses that are in here and put a piece of it out of this cell. But I'm putting it by a class 1 MHC. This is a class 2, this is a class 1. A killer T cell recognizes class 1. A helper T cell recognizes class 2. When this killer T cell, after it's activated from here, sees this here, it binds over here, and this killer T cell releases perforins. To perforate, put holes into this cell. This allows water and electrolytes to enter that cell, change the membrane potential, and destroys that cell. Sure, that's your cell, but it's being destroyed. But it's infected. You can't do anything about it. Let's destroy this one over here. If this Xerox machine, I can't stop it. It keeps putting out a lot of, a lot of uh, advertisements. The best thing to do is just unplug it. And I can't use that Xerox machine. I have to go find another Xerox machine. But it's, and once I plug it back in, it's still putting it out because it keeps it in its memory. You see? So it's okay to destroy that. Because this is just putting out 
too many viruses. We're going right to the source. Does that make sense? Okay, killer T cell, it kills cells. Helper T cell, it doesn't kill, it's going to get more people involved over here. It also, once the helper T cell gets activated, it's going to activate B cells. And B cells are going to make antibodies. And antibodies are used in so many different ways. They don't attack anything, but they label things so that the killer T cells know where to attack if they need to. They may also coat the virus to neutralize it. For instance, you have a baby that has nails on it. You don't want the baby to scratch its face, so we put a mitten on it. We're not destroying the hand. We're putting a neutralization on the hand so that it doesn't scratch itself. We're putting, uh, we're going to coat the virus so that we won't have, uh, that, that won't be able to attack or anything. But it's only a temporary measure. That's one of many different things that the antibodies do. Okay? And that's what the B cells do. So the helper T cell gets more helper T cells, activates killer T cells, activates B cells. This is an important cell. If you destroy this, you're not going to get any of this, which means you lose the battle. And that's what HIV kills. It's the helper T cell. So your immune system goes down big time. And you die from Okay? So that makes sense. All right, this is how your body fights bacteria, and this is how it fights viruses. Okay, step by step. Good? All right. That was my review. I did it roughly about an hour. I thought 45 minutes. Activation of the immune response typically begins when a pathogen enters the body. Macrophages that encounter the pathogen ingest, process, and display the antigen fragments on their cell surfaces. Macrophages with antigen fragments displayed on their surfaces are called antigen-presenting cells. An antigen-presenting macrophage interacts with a T-helper cell that can recognize the same antigen. During the interaction, the macrophage releases a chemical alarm signal called interleukin-1, which stimulates the T-helper cell to secrete interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 causes the proliferation of certain cytotoxic T-cells and B-cells. The immune response from this point follows two paths, one using cytotoxic T-cells and one using B-cells. Normal cells of the body that become infected can also digest some of the pathogens and display antigen fragments on their cell surfaces. The body makes millions of different types of cytotoxic T-cells. Each type is able to recognize a particular antigen. The cytotoxic T-cells that are capable of recognizing the antigen displayed on the surfaces of infected cells bind to the infected cells and produce chemicals that kill the infected cell. Death of the infected cells results in destruction of the pathogen. B cells also come in millions of different types, each able to recognize a particular antigen. When B cells become activated by T helper cells, they differentiate into plasma cells. These plasma cells become antibody-producing factories, flooding the bloodstream with antibodies that can bind to the antigen involved in this infection. Antibodies bind to the antigens on the surfaces of the pathogens, marking them for destruction by macrophages. Some of the B cells do not turn into antibody factories, but instead become memory B cells that may survive for several decades. Because of these memory B cells, the secondary immune response to a future infection by the same pathogen is swifter and stronger. This powerful secondary immune response is what gives immunity to some diseases after you have had them once or after you have been vaccinated.